In this video, I'd like to talk further about what I was saying last time with reference to corruption, specifically the corruption of knowledge. We have many examples in this country of people who are assuming positions of authority and power, speaking about subjects which they know very little about. There was a case of a friend of mine who introduced me to a video that he'd watched, a short video. And in that short video was purportedly someone from a political party, an Islamic political party in this country, presumably giving a press conference with his interpreter. And in that press conference, he was saying that in reality, this is according to his interpreter as well, the way his interpreter interpreted the thing, the, the man from the political party, he spoke in Malay, and he said, Raswah tidak terkandung dalam undang-undang hudud. To which the interpreter, reply, uh, the interpreter translated it as, Corruption is not included in the hudud, the laws of hudud. Then he went on to say, Ta'rif uh, raswah ini ialah um, memberi dan menerima dengan secara sukarela tetapi dengan cara yang salah to which his interpreter translated as the receiving and giving of things voluntarily but in a wrong way and then the video clip ended soon after that and so this friend of mine asked me is it true that uh, that uh, Raswa is not part of Hudud now I didn't know whether it was part of the Hudud or not to tell you the truth but I asked him why do you ask me this question and he said because he finds it amazing that it seems to him that they are trying to legalize Raswa I can understand why he would think that because when I first heard that short clip it also implied the same kind of thing as if it's permissible. Now we can't say whether or not this what the intent of the press conference or whatever that gathering was what the purpose was nor can we say what the conclusion of that press conference was because it was a very short video clip so we don't really know what the intent of the speaker in saying these things was. But what we can say is this. To begin with, why do you begin by saying that Raswa tidak terkandung dalam undang-undang hudud? What was the legitimacy of saying such a thing? Because it gives the impression to the listener that you are saying that because it's not part of the penal code, the Islamic penal code, that it's okay. That's the assumption that many people got, not just me, but the people who also listened to that video who came and asked me the question whether or not it is okay in Islam or not. Now, I was rather shocked because, first of all, I don't see the purpose of bringing that up. Secondly, when the interpreter translated into English, he said corruption is not part of the hudud. That is a mistake. He should have said, bribery is not part of the hudud. Secondly, when he defined it as the giving and receiving of goods voluntarily between two people, but in a wrong way, to my view, that is not correct. Because it assumes, therefore, that there is no victim, which means that there is no crime. And that is wrong. In reality, this bribery it is not between two. There has to be a third, and the third is the victim. There has to be a third. Now, if we look at it like that, we can say that there is the bribe giver, the bribe taker, and the victim. Right? Now, if that's the case, it cannot be a, voluntar a, voluntar a voluntarily uh, assumed thing. I'll give you an example. Let's say there is a developer a politician and the government. The government issue, wants to issue a contract to develop a certain thing. 
So the developer now is trying to vie for that government contract. But he knows that he probably wouldn't be able to get it going through the normal channels. So he decides to ask the help of, or the favor of a politician. And he tells the politician that if he is awarded this contract with the politician's help, that he will somehow afford him a certain percentage of that contract. Which means, therefore, that the developer will be awarded the contract on condition that he gives some portion of that to the uh, politician without the knowledge of the government. So therefore, the government here is the victim. The politician and the developer now are the beneficiaries of this contract. That is what bribery is. So it's very different from saying it's an agreement voluntarily between two people because in that case there is no a victim and to my mind if you say that if you say that it's just a volunteer voluntarily entered into agreement between two people you are more or less describing barter that's what it is but the bigger problem that I see and in fact this is the biggest problem with this whole scenario is this the speaker who was speaking in Malay from that Islamic political party, he failed to mention in that video, I don't know whether he mentioned it later on or not, but in that video clip he failed to mention that the huge problem, in other words the problem of corruption in general, that is referred to as fasad, not as rasuwa. Rasuwa is subsumed underneath the umbrella of corruption. Corruption in general. That is the, a big sin. I mean this facade is a big sin. Why? Because this facade, translated into English as corruption, it has a social element to it as well, which means that it damages the social fabric. And because it damages the social fabric, that is a sinful act. And therefore, corruption in general is a big sin. Whether or not it is subsumed within the penal code under Raswa or not is irrelevant because it is still a huge sin. That should be known and understood. And therefore it appears to me, at least from that video's point of view, that what one is trying to do is one is trying to tell the viewer or the listener that as long as you agree with another person that you are going to do a certain thing, that it's okay, even if it's done in a wrong way. That is, that is, I think, very, very bad, very wrong. And that speaks to the level of corruption we have in the Muslim world, specifically in this country. Now, before when I spoke about corruption of knowledge, I was speaking of corruption of knowledge in particular. But we can expand that. It is not just corruption of knowledge, although everything else stems from the corruption of knowledge. What we have and what we suffer from here, especially in Malaysia, is a corruption in general, not just of knowledge. Knowledge is the starting point. Now we also have the corruption of the environment, where we destroy without even thinking, where we, where we are guided by, or misguided rather, by our greed, that we, that we destroy the environment all in the name of greed. We have social corruption, we have corruption of the society. Our social fabric is being gradually eroded thanks again to the corruption of knowledge that, that uh, misguides people. We also have the corruption of the judiciary. Look at our judiciary today. Somehow I find that it is not just, that it does not actually reflect justice in its true sense. We don't have judges now, it appears, who actually use discretion in their judgments, who actually use, <laughs> to use a better word, they don't actually use hikmah. And if you don't use hikmah, which translates loosely into English as wisdom, how can you then become a hakim, which is what these people are called now? And as a Hakim, how can you then refer to yourself as young Arif when you know not, when your discernment is vacant, when your discernment is absent? I find that it is a problem today. One judge will give a judgment. 
it'll go to appeal. It comes to another set of judges who say the first one made an error and they give the reason why, whether it's technicality or not. What you are basically saying is that this judge knows nothing, but we know better. And then the other one will say, no, he knows better, the other ones know nothing. Where is the confidence? We have no confidence. You don't argue cases with wisdom. There is no hikmah. So we have a problem in the judiciary. That is already corrupted. What about the legislative? The legislative arm is also corrupted. We have all these lawmakers who make laws seemingly to benefit themselves and their political parties and their followers. That is not right. That is not just. Of course, then we have the executive. The executive corruption that we have in this country. That one is already quite well known. It is reported widely. But what about the other two? And therefore, when we look at corruption as a whole, we have what is called systemic corruption. It's a systemic corruption. It's not just one small thing. And some people misunderstand when I say we have a problem of corruption of knowledge. They think that it is an abstract, that corruption of knowledge is an abstract, that it's something out there, that that's just one thing. Everything else is fine without realizing that this corruption of knowledge leads to every other form of corruption. It is the root cause of everything else. Now, you cannot view it as an abstract in that case. You have to see it as a universal whole, that this is what we are suffering from. After I made that video, one of the political members wanted to get in touch with me to discuss further this problem. And I'm still intending to meet with him. But I must say that even if we describe it, even if we try to tell what the meaning of corruption of knowledge is, there are still those who don't seem to understand and continually ask me the same question. Yes, they say, we understand that this is happening, but then what do we do about it? But we've already given the solution in the problem. When we describe what our problem is, we have a corruption of knowledge problem, and therefore, what we have to do is we have to get rid of those people who are not properly qualified. If you ask me how do you get rid of the people who are not properly qualified, you do not appoint them. You do not vote for them. You do not place them in positions of authority and power. That's how you get rid of them. If you say then to me, well, we are in this country, we have a democ democratic system. Okay, well then use that democratic system because every one of us is represented by a wakil rayat. I mean, even this word, wakil ra'yat, it has a scientific meaning, thanks to the Malay language again. Wakil, representative. Ra'yat literally means that we ourselves are, are the masters of our destiny. We are the shepherds. And therefore, we have, as shepherds, as masters of our destiny, we have appointed someone from amongst our flock to represent us. Clearly then, if you are unhappy now and you say, yes, we recognize there is a problem, it is clear, therefore, that your representative is not doing the job that you entrusted him to do. And therefore, what you have to do is you have to go and tell this Wakil Ra'yad, either you leave and appoint somebody else, and we appoint somebody else, or you finally listen to us and you make our views known in the parliament. If that's not going to happen, then you have to go to the parliament yourself. You have a right. You have a right to go there, you have a right to debate there yourself. If the Wakil Ra'yat is not doing the job for you, if he has shirked his responsibility, again, other videos that I've made already said, a good man is one who when he speaks, he tells the truth. When he's given a trust, he doesn't betray that trust. When he makes a promise, he fulfills that promise. The Wakil Ra'yat, as your good representative, is supposed to do that. But if he is not doing that, then it's your duty because you are masters of your own destiny. That's what ra'yat is. It's from the Arabic language term ra'in. You then should tell this fellow, the wakil ra'yat, you are not doing the, the job and the duty assigned to you. Therefore, we have every right to appoint somebody else to replace you. I mean, I'm not going to write a handbook on every single step about how to get rid of this person, how to get rid of that person, how to eradicate the problem. We should already know this if we have knowledge. And that again is 
going back to the earlier problem that I discussed earlier, when it comes to the corruption of knowledge, when somebody asked me, what is knowledge? Or how do we get knowledge? I mean, that's a ridiculous question in my opinion. How do you know that this is something wrong? You have to go and find out and learn and study. And it's not something you can do overnight. It will take years. But then, if you don't have that kind of time, you have to put your trust in people who actually do know what they're talking about. Again, I mentioned that in one of my videos in the past. Those who know and know they know. You have to trust. If you can see now that the person you've entrusted to has not done the job, has betrayed your trust, I know it's difficult for you to start trusting again, but you have to. You have no other choice but to trust and get rid of the bad and put the good. In Malaysia, this is our problem. We are not saying that it is limited just to Malaysia. This is a, a global problem. But because we are concerned about our home, we are talking like this. Look at all the institutions in our country. They have been gradually destroyed by this corruption of knowledge. Look at our Sharia courts. Are they just? The Sharia, as we already have described earlier, is supposed to be an ethical and moral code of conduct which we are supposed to adhere to. Now the Sharia courts, are they just? If you say yes, then we have nothing to talk about. But if you say no, we don't think they are just. Why? Because why does it take so long, for instance, for divorces to go through the Sharia court system? Why is it that it appears that the vast majority of people who are victimized are women? How is it possible? This is not just. And yet it takes years for a, for a, for a, a wife to divorce her husband. Why? The argument given was that well, you know, sometimes it takes a long time because we can't rush things. We're following the ways of the Prophet. The Prophet said when it comes to this kind of thing, because he doesn't like divorce, therefore we shouldn't be hasty. Okay, that is true. The Prophet did say such a thing. But uh, is what you are doing reflective of what the Prophet said? I would say no. There was a case when one of, the, one of uh, a lady came to the Prophet. And she said to the Prophet, we'd like your blessing because I'd like to marry this man. The Prophet said, no, I don't give my blessing first because he realized that this woman was a noble woman and the man that she wanted to marry was not a nobleman, that he was just an ordinary man. And therefore the Prophet said, there's going, he thought to himself, obviously, that there's probably going to be problems associated with the marriage because they are from a different social class or social level or cultural level, not social level, cultural level. So he, he, didn't, he decided not to give his blessing. The lady came again, asked him, please, after a few weeks. The Prophet again said no. Again, the lady waited a few more weeks and then came to the Prophet again and said, please, we, are, we want to get married. We don't, we don't want to commit sin. So the Prophet allowed them to get married. Anyway, true to form, because what the Prophet thought, that they are from a different cultural level, it so happened that they came back to the Prophet after a few months or a few years, and they said to the Prophet, we'd like to divorce. Now the Prophet doesn't like divorce. So he said to them, no, I don't give permission. Wait, try to work things out. So they waited. They tried to work things out, but they couldn't because their cultural differences were so big. There was no reconciliation at all for the cultural difference. They came back to the Prophet again. The Prophet said, no, I don't give my blessing to divorce. Go back and try to work things out. Again, they tried. But then the third time when she came to the Prophet and asked the Prophet, please, we want a divorce, we cannot, we cannot continue like this. The Prophet allowed them to divorce. Now, my question is, how long was it from the first time she came and asked the Prophet for a divorce until the time the Prophet finally gave them a divorce? Was it years? Of course not. That would be unjust of the Prophet to wait years. It was not years. We are definitely certain about that. He didn't ask them to wait that long. They thought within a matter of months. Now, is that what's happening in the Sharia court today? There are some ladies, our sisters in Islam, who have been waiting for 15 years to get divorced. That is unjust. You are, you are committing a great injustice to both the husband and the wife. 
They both can't live their own separate lives now. They can't remarry. They can't have another family. They can't do any of that. Simply because you, the Sharia court, has delayed them. What about when it comes to uh, division of wealth in the family? How many years does it take you to, to finalize that kind of a thing? In our, own, in our own personal experience, we have experience in this. It takes years. That is unjust. Very unjust. And therefore, we are saying again, what is the state of our Hakim Hakim, who are supposed to know the Hukum Hakam, and they are supposed to think and decide with Hikmah, all from the same word, from the same root. What has happened to them? Therefore, we can surmise there is no Hikmah. They are not cognizant of the Hukum Hakam, and therefore they are not fit to be Hakim. What about today? Now we have a budget announced, a very lopsided budget, a very unjust budget. A lot of people understand that this budget is not correct, it's not right, it's not fair. Not to say the non-Muslims know this, but the Muslims also know this, that it's a very unfair budget. It's very lopsided and it's not reflective of what we would call masharakat. And yet, what do we do? We say nothing. We are now going to be blamed for keeping quiet. This budget is heavily lopsided, it's heavily unjust. If they say that, well, the reason the budget is like this is because the Malayu and the Bumiputra, they need more assistance because they are a larger majority in this country and they need bigger, bigger assistance. Then I would ask the question, what is the institution of the Zakat doing? How do we have billions of dollars in the institution of the Zakat and yet we have Malays who are suffering and who need the Zakat? They make it difficult for you to get the zakat. There are several categories that qualify you to be, a, to be a zakat recipient. Why does it take so long and the steps are so tedious and difficult for you to receive zakat? That is not right. Again, you are not following the sunnah of the Prophet. The Prophet says you have to make things easy, not make things difficult. You have to clear all the obstacles from... from, uh, from uh, from their way and not place obstacles in their way and yet what we are seeing now is you are doing the exact opposite you are making something easy difficult and you are placing obstacles when there should not be obstacles unjust this is a great injustice and it all stems from the corruption of knowledge because you are not properly qualified you are not properly trained you are not properly knowledgeable on things that you should be and yet you are put in a position of authority and power. Not right. So, how do we overcome this? As I said before, you are the ones who hold the power in your hands. If you understand and you recognize that there is a problem, it is up to you. If your wakil rakyat is not doing the job, you have to remove the fellow. Get another wakil rakyat. Appoint somebody else. If they don't want to and they refuse, you can go to the parliament. It is your right. You have the right to speak up. Thank you very much.